On June 18, 1935, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement was signed. Under this agreement, Germany undertook to limit its naval armament to 35% of the British. This voluntary self-restriction was explained by the situation in which the German Empire was then. Over Germany were the regulations of the Treaty of Versailles, by virtue of which it was essentially disarmed, while the disarmament of the victorious powers, as stipulated in the treaty, did not occur. Hitler, in an effort to gradually free himself from these shackles, declared the imposition of military sovereignty on March 16, 1935. In an effort to break England away from the grouping of the victorious powers, which were expected to oppose, Hitler prudently entered into negotiations with her on a naval agreement. He hoped in this way to exclude England from the ranks of political adversaries and for the future, because Germany's voluntary limitation of its naval armament said that it did not have aggressive intentions against England. However, further events showed that by taking such a decision, the then German state leadership in vain puffed themselves up with such a hope. Historically, England's hostility to this or that European state was determined primarily by political and economic considerations, even if it did not feel the enemy threatened at sea. Striving for economic dominance, England saw a threat to its power in the strengthening of any European state, hence the famous British policy of European equilibrium. This circumstance could not but play its role in the following years, despite the 1935 agreement that limited Germany's naval armament. Of course, in 1935, England went along with Hitler's offer. Under the treaty, Germany had the right to build a fleet whose total displacement was not to exceed 35% of the British fleet. This ratio applied to all classes of surface ship. For submarines, the ratio was set at 45%. It was envisaged that through joint friendly discussion, this percentage could later be raised to 100% of the displacement of the British submarine fleet. So, in accordance with the numerical composition of the British Navy Germany, in 1935, under this agreement, could have the following total displacement of warships by class. Line ships, 184,000 tonnes, heavy cruisers, 51,000 tonnes, light cruisers, 67,000 tonnes, aircraft carriers, 47,000 tonnes, destroyers, 52,000 tonnes, submarines, 24,000 tonnes. Focusing on the creation of new German submarine forces, it is necessary to pay special attention to the above figure of submarine displacement. And although the total displacement of submarines amounted to 45% of the displacement of the English submarine fleet, in general it turned out to be very small. Because of its island position, England depended entirely on the importation of food and raw materials. Maritime communications with the colonial possessions were therefore of vital importance to the British Empire. For a number of centuries, the strategic task of the English Navy was to protect these maritime communications. This task could be accomplished not by submarines, but by surface ships. Submarine is least suitable for defence. It is very vulnerable in the surface position, slow and can view only a limited area, as it does not have high superstructures. But at the same time, the submarine is a distinctly tactical offensive tool. England had no potential opponents on the sea communications against which she would have to deploy in the event of military conflict the actions of large submarine forces, and so her navy did not need a large number of submarines. The size of its submarine force in the 30s was small. It was only about two-thirds of the size of the submarine fleet of the French navy, and since submarines were of secondary importance in the English navy, England made a very minor concession agreeing to Germany to build submarines whose total displacement would be 45% of the displacement of the English submarine force, rather than 35%, as was established for other classes of ships. Consequently, because of their small numbers, submarines could not be a serious factor in the new, homogeneous fleet then being planned. In 1936, the maritime powers included in the London Protocol on submarine forces another agreement that fully met the interests of England in the case of combat use of submarines. It stipulated the following. In apprehending and sinking merchant ships, the submarine must act as a surface ship. This requirement remained in force, even if the merchant ships were equipped with guns installed for self-defense only. Merchant ships, despite the nature of the armament, were still considered commercial and enjoyed appropriate international legal protection. This meant that the submarines had to detain and search merchant ships in accordance with international rules of commercial warfare and prize law. 
if, under the terms of prize law, a submarine could sink a ship, it was obliged to first ensure the safety of the crew. Since lifeboats alone were considered insufficient for the safety of the crew on the high seas, the submarine had to either take them on board or refuse to sink the ship. After the signing of the Anglo-German Maritime Agreement in 1935, Germany on November 23, 1936, joined the above-mentioned protocol as well, which further reduced the combat value of the submarine. To the two factors we have already mentioned, a third was added. After the First World War, the British wrote a great deal about the Arsdijk, a new means of detecting submarines in an underwater position. This device allegedly allowed to detect submarines at a distance of several thousand meters. In general, the submarine was declared in England an obsolete fighting force. It was even believed that other nations should not have built submarines. Based on these considerations, and in the German Navy in 1935 began to doubt the combat value of submarines. Although the dangers of submarine service, independence of action and not faded since the First World War glory of German submarines, still attracted to submarine service capable young officers, non-commissioned officers and sailors. With the construction of submarines, the case was as follows. Preparations for the construction of submarines were conducted by the General Command of the German Navy since 1932. They were laid in early 1935 during negotiations with England on the ratio of displacement of naval fleets. They were very small boats of 250 tons displacement. At the end of September 1935, six of these boats were transferred to the Anti-Submarine Defence School, later renamed the Submarine School. Here, the initial technical training and training of teams in submarine navigation took place. On September 28, 1935, Three new submarines entered service, U-7, U-8 and U-9 with displacement of 250 tons each. These boats made up the first flotilla of submarines Vedigen. In the rank of Captain Second Rank, I became its command. Within a few months in the flotilla Vedigen were included nine more submarines of the same type. In the first flotilla, submarine commanders and other officers were selected especially carefully. I was not given any orders instructions or instructions on combat training flotilla as it was first organized after 1918, that is, after a long break during which we did not have submarines. And that was the right thing to do. I had my own considerations regarding the organization of combat training. 1. I wanted to infect the submarine crews with enthusiasm and faith in this weapon, to cultivate in them a sense of constant combat readiness, success during the war, if we take into account the difficulties encountered by submarines during the battle, can be achieved only if there is a high morale among the crew members of the boats. Combat skill alone is not enough. First of all, it was necessary to knock out of the minds of submariners, depressing them the idea that as a result of the improvement of the British Sunna submarine became an obsolete weapon. I believed in the combat power of the submarine and still considered it a superior weapon of attack in naval warfare and the best carrier of torpedo weapons. Two, combat training of submarine forces should be conducted in an environment as close to combat conditions as possible. Submarines even in peacetime had to operate as often as possible in the environment in which they could find themselves during the war and achieve the desired results. Two, three, in underwater and surface positions, torpedo attacks had to be made only at close ranges. At short distances, errors caused by incorrect assessment of the initial data, almost no effect on the results of firing. Shot at close range gave a hit for sure. Even if the attack ship noticed the trace of the torpedo, it did not have time to evade. In the summer of 1935, in the school of scuba diving novice submariners, were taught, when firing a torpedo from an underwater position, the distance should be at least 3,000 metres, because otherwise the submarine will be detected by the English ASDIC. At the end of September 1935, I was appointed commander of the flotilla Vedigen. That's when I began to wage a determined struggle with this point of view, considering the effectiveness of the ASDIC unproven. We simply had no right to recognize ourselves defeated on the basis of English publications alone. The war proved the correctness of my position. 4. In my opinion, the submarine was an excellent carrier of torpedo weapons and could be used to great effect in night attacks in a surface position. Even before 1900, Tirpitz had developed the idea of delivering torpedoes to the enemy at close distance at night on a torpedo boat, which with its insignificant superstructures was a hard-to-detect target. 
This task could now be accomplished by a submarine. In the view of Tirpitz, ideal torpedo carrier was a torpedo boat. However, as a result of the new task set before him, as well as the result of competition in the combat power of ship's torpedo boat, over the past decades has turned first into a destroyer, and then into a destroyer squadron, which was no longer suitable for night torpedo attack at close range, because it was too large and was an easily detectable target. On the contrary, it is extremely difficult to detect a submarine at night in a positional position. That is why great importance was attached to the use of submarines in a surface position for night attacks, during which they had to apply the tactical techniques of destroyers and utilize their combat experience, but to the extent that they could be transferred to the combat use of submarines. 5. The main objectives of combat training, however, concerned the field of tactics. Here new problems arose. A. By organizing tactical cooperation and appropriate leadership, it was necessary to concentrate as many submarines as possible to attack the intended target. This applies to any single target of interest, and above all to group targets such as warship formations and convoys. As a result, a large number of submarines were opposed to a large number of targets. Victor's submarine has a low visibility and low speed, even in a surface position. For a certain period of time it can inspect a relatively small area, which makes it unsuitable for tactical reconnaissance. This necessitates the interaction of submarines with other branches of the force, more suitable for reconnaissance. The best means of reconnaissance is an airplane. At that time, these problems had not yet received a practical solution, and the submarine continued to operate alone. On October 1, 1935, in accordance with the outlined principles began combat training flotilla of Edigen. The submarines were to remain underwater and surface for as long as possible, and in remote sea areas and in all weathers. The aim was primarily to accustom the personnel to being on a submarine for long periods of time, to re them and to teach them how to use the navigational instruments correctly. The semi-annual training program was divided into a number of tasks of increasing complexity, which were brought to the attention of submarine crews in advance. We were especially persistent in assuring that the fundamentals were mastered. Thus, before in December 1935 submarines went to the range for live torpedo firing, each of them performed 66 training attacks in the underwater and the same number in the surface position. The closeness of training to combat conditions was reflected in all elements of training and in rules governing the submarine's behavior in areas, controlled by the ENEAS, controlled by the ENEAS, controlled by the ENE, in the requirement of secrecy, should dive and when it could remain in the surface position, in the secrecy of the attack with the most economical and competent use of the periscope, and the requirement to skillfully use the background, lighting, wind, waves, and small silhouette during night operations. In the course of combat training, tactical techniques were practiced that were most likely to be used in actual combat operations. It was reflected in the following requirements. To observe secrecy when maintaining contact with the enemy and when going to the head of the convoy, to act in a certain way during the morning and evening twilight when meeting the enemy's anti-submarine forces, to know perfectly the material part and structure of the submarine, to master the technique of underwater navigation at all depths, taking into account all possible conditions of battle, to combine fire training of artillery and anti-aircraft units with the training of emergency diving. I and the flotilla's flagship mechanic were the only officers of the new submarine force with combat experience. In October 1935, we began by going to sea from one submarine to another. The mechanical engineer taught technical operation of the engines and boat control techniques when submerged, and I taught attack under periscope and in the surface position. In any weather we were at sea and tirelessly trained submariners. And very soon the sailors of the Vedigin flotilla became submarine enthusiasts. Tireless combat training. The implementation of the principle of at sea, at home. The development of the team consciousness that combat training is important. That diligence is encouraged. That the skill of submariners is growing all this encouraged the personnel of the flotilla. I constantly studied my subordinates. It was my rule, and they too soon got to know me well. Mutual trust arose. In the fall of 1936, after the flotilla Vedigin completed the first year of training, I was appointed commander of the submarine forces. In 1937, the commander of one of the submarines of the Vedigin flotilla described the 1935-6 training year as follows. 
the knowledge acquired during the year of intense study, during which the training load was pushed to the limit, was the basis for the further development of the submarine force, as far as the choice of boat types, armament and methods of combat training was concerned. In the following years, submarine tactics were further developed. England literally before our eyes was turning into our potential adversary, so the use of submarines went along the lines of adaptation to the conditions of the high seas and the fight against convoys. In principle, nothing else changed. The most remarkable event of the 1935-6 academic year is that submarine commanders and personnel were freed from the obsessive idea that submarines were obsolete weapons and were no longer capable of effective combat activity because of the development of anti-submarine defence forces and means. It seems to me that this assessment by the former commander of the submarine flotilla Vedigen is true. It is time to address the following two tactical problems, namely submarine-aircraft interaction and submarine-to-submarine -submarine interaction. The former problem will be covered in a later section and the latter in the present section. One of the most natural requirements of armed struggle is that man endeavours to gather as much strength as possible for the struggle and, not wishing to fight alone, seeks help from others. For this reason, since time immemorial, men have gathered in groups before battle. In the First World War, submarine warfare was an exception to this rule. They acted alone. This essential flaw in submarine tactics was most fully revealed during the period when the British introduced the convoy system. In the spring of 1917, Captain Second Rank Bauer, who commanded submarines subordinate to the command of the surface fleet, a special report asked to provide him with the first ocean submarine coming into service to go to the area west of Ireland and personally study the form in which submarines can carry out joint actions against convoys. His request was denied. Unfortunately, during the First World War, proposals for joint boat action and other such ideas did not come to the attention of all submarine commanders. Submarine flotillas at that time were subordinate to different command authorities so it was simply impossible to disseminate such an idea, not to mention the possibility to follow its fate. This idea did not receive practical realisation probably also, because it was perceived at that time as too theoretical. In any case, the First World War did not give a single example of truly joint actions of at least two submarines. As a result of the introduction of the convoy system, submarine actions during the First World War failed. As early as 1935, when I was appointed commander of the first submarine flotilla, I was aware of the need to solve the problem of joint submarine warfare. Since the end of 1935, in the course of organising the cooperation of submarines of the flotilla Vedigen, a number of problems have arisen. This is evidenced by the following two documents. The first one was written by the commander of one of the submarines of the flotilla Vedigen, and the second one was written by me in 1946 in Nuremberg when I wrote down the most significant milestones of the last years of my service in anticipation of my sentence. Here is what the first document says about the tactical training of the flotilla Vedigen, which began at the end of September 1935. The flotilla commander gave his first thoughts on the development of submarine tactics. The concentration of submarines against a common target necessitated tactical interaction between submarines performing a particular task in a particular operational area. The task was to find the enemy, report him to the command and attack him as many submarines as possible. So the end of 1935 was the year of birth of group tactics of submarines, later raised to the degree of a true art. Its development went through a number of stages. In the beginning for a model taken the actions of destroyers in reconnaissance and guard. To fulfil the tasks of searching and intercepting the enemy submarines began to act as curtains. When detecting the enemy submarine sent a report and attacked him, and the other boats went to her aid. This method was justified only if the enemy was inferior to the submarines in speed. To make it more effective, behind the reconnaissance veil placed one or more groups of submarines which were supposed to destroy the detected enemy. In the course of endless exercises and manoeuvres tactical techniques were practised in a variety of variants. Gradually came to a circular arrangement of submarines in which the boat, the first to notice the enemy entered inside the circle, followed him, maintaining contact, and the boats located on both side arcs formed a support group. The accumulated experience was reflected in the constantly updated and refined documents on submarine tactics. And here is what I wrote in Nuremberg in 1946. Men practicing group actions of submarines, 
many private questions arose. They mainly related to the following areas. A. The field of control. To what limit should unified control extend only up to the moment of contact with the enemy or also during the attack? How best to combine unified command with independent submarine action? Should control be exercised from the sea? If so, should it be from a surface ship or a submarine? Is it even possible to direct the action while on the submarine? Where must the submarine be located to be able to control other submarines? Can submarines be fully or partially controlled from shore? Is control from the sea also necessary in this case? Where is the boundary between these two types of control? A. The area of warning and communication. How, while on a submarine, on board a surface ship or ashore, is it possible to communicate with a submarine in a surface, periscope depth or underwater position? What communications equipment is required to accomplish this? Which band should be used, short wave or long wave? What is the range of radio communication under different meteorological conditions on land and at sea day and night? What are the conditions for radio transmission on a submarine? What reception and transmission conditions must the submarine being controlled have? The next group of questions is bearing transmission warning, bearing transmission and bearing reception. The compilation of convenient and reliable codes, the form of orders and reports. This research work disintegrated in turn into a host of technical problems and tasks aimed at improving the transceiving and transmitting facilities. E for the field of tactics. How should cooperating submarines behave while en route to a combat area? Should they be brought together and how or dispersed and in what form? What arrangement of boats and what manoeuvre is most appropriate when it is necessary to conduct reconnaissance independently, to support or to take over reconnaissance conducted by other means? What order of battle should submarine groups adopt before attacking, closed, open, deployed along the front, or echeloned in depth? What are the distances between groups and individual boats, or should the latter be completely dispersed? Then in what manner, in line or staggered? How many submarines would be required to reliably ensure contact with the enemy? Is it necessary and possible to assign submarines for this purpose in advance? What is the method of changing them? In what case can the boat maintaining contact itself attack the enemy? In my opinion, both excerpts give a true picture of the research and problems of the time. For the first time, the tactics of submarines as a group were used in large maneuvers of the German armed forces in the fall of 1937. I, as commander of the submarine forces, was on a floating submarine base in Kiel and controlled by radio, the submarines operating in the Baltic Sea. They were tasked to find in the open sea north of the coast of Pomerania and East Prussia connection of enemy ships and convoy, and, approaching it, attack it. In the course of manoeuvring the group of submarines to target the enemy was successful. After the exercises in the North Sea submarines in May 1939, practiced the tactics of group actions in the Atlantic, west of the Iberian Peninsula and the Bay of Biscay. A huge role in the realization of my plans played Fleet Commander Admiral Bohm, who put at my disposal the necessary surface ships. In July 1939, similar exercises were conducted in the Baltic Sea in the presence of the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy. The exercises showed that in principle the problem had been solved, and that even the private questions of submarine group tactics had been largely clarified to the extent that they could be clarified in a peaceful situation. The unresolved question was whether it was possible to control submarines at a great distance, for example in the Atlantic, from German territory. Therefore, I envisioned a variant of submarine control from the sea, raising the question of the construction of staff submarines specially equipped with communications equipment and had the appropriate battle stations. However, the war showed that submarines should be controlled only from the shore. The first documents concerning group tactics were compiled at the end of 1935 and later were constantly supplemented. During the war, all materials on the tactics of group actions of boats were collected in the handbook of the submarine commander, the reaction of the British Navy to the training of German submarines in group tactics, conducted since 1935. In peacetime, that is, in 1935-1939 years, I believed that the group tactics could not remain a secret, because in practicing it during manoeuvres participated in all units of the German Navy and thousands of people knew about it. And although in my book Underwater Weapons, published in 1937 Open Edition, the term group tactics was not mentioned, 
Everything in it insistently emphasized the advantages of night attack submarines in the surface position. This type of attack was used by submarines at the end of World War I and was no secret to anyone. And the greatest surprise to me was the fact that England was completely unprepared for submarine attacks in a surface position or to group tactics. In his book War at Sea, Roskill wrote, It has been previously reported that the period from June to October 1940 was marked by great successes by some German submarine commanders. As long as the enemy's submarine forces were few in number, their commander had no choice but to leave the submarine commanders to act alone, whoever could. But when the number of submarines at his disposal increased, he was able to organize attacks that simultaneously involved several submarines. The commander has long waited for an opportunity, and here in the period from October 1940 to March 1941, stealthily created the so-called wolf packs. This innovation took us by surprise. Roskill further writes, From the British point of view, the development carried with it many serious problems, for the enemy employed a form of attack which we had not foreseen and for which we had not prepared ourselves either technically or tactically. The book explains why the German wolf pack tactics came as a surprise to the British Navy. Between the First and Second World Wars, the British trained their submariners mainly in torpedo attack from an underwater position, although exercises sometimes included night attacks in a surface position. This is why the English Navy placed great emphasis on detecting boats in an underwater position. One manifestation of this attention was the development of sonar capable of detecting a submarine in an underwater position. On this device in England had high hopes. It was for this reason that a report prepared by the British Admiralty in 1937 for the Advisory Committee for the Protection of Shipping stated that the submarine will never again be able to put us in the problem we faced in 1917 Dubny. Because the English Navy had sonar to detect submarines in an underwater position, British commanders effectively overlooked the dangers of submarine warfare between World Wars I and II. In addition to these factors, a significant role was probably also played by the principled attitude of the British Admiralty, the meaning of which will be clear from the following. The question naturally arises in the mind of the reader. Why did we not foresee the possibility of the enemy's use of group tactics and directed our energy and attention only to the fight against submarines operating in an underwater position? A consideration of the period between the First and Second World Wars reveals the fact that both the combat, training and naval doctrine of the British Navy emphasised the readiness of surface ships for action against enemy surface ships. The defence of merchant shipping was viewed primarily in terms of repelling attacks by enemy surface ships. A statement made in August 1939 by the First Lord of the Admiralty to the Chiefs of Staff Committee regarding the possible threat to merchant shipping from enemy surface ships shows the extent to which this view dominated our naval doctrine before the war. It seems to me that this way of thinking should be recalled because it was characteristic of all navies without ex It shows how difficult it is for a naval officer raised in the spirit of surface warfare to understand and appreciate the importance of another form of warfare, submarine warfare. From a human point of view, it is quite understandable. Such an officer lives his own ideas about war, and if in addition he is persistent in achieving the goal, he will seek all possible means that will allow him to win the imposed sea battle. He hopes and believes in these means. That is why the importance of submarines, even in navies, was either not realized at all or was realized too late. This can be seen from the above excerpt, and as the Second World War showed, the importance of submarines was not realized even in the English Navy, although during the First World War German submarines plunged England into the worst crisis in its history. The command of the German Navy and the leaders of the German state belatedly and far from fully realized the importance of submarines and did not provide in a timely manner the funds necessary for their construction. These are the reasons for the tragedy that befell the German submarine forces during World War II. Deciding what ships should be built for a given navy is the prerogative of the high command. Only the supreme military commander who bears full responsibility is directly connected with the state leaders. Only he receives from the state leadership information about the political situation and determines the strategic direction in the construction of the fleet, because he knows what enemy will have to meet, in all likelihood, the name. The question of strategic objectives is primary. From the answer to this question follows the answer to the second root quest. What forces and means are necessary to solve the tasks set in the war at sea?
In the light of the decisions taken, the preparation of these forces and means should be carried out without reckoning with any, their own or foreign, traditional ideas about the fleet. The Anglo-German Maritime Agreement of 1935 was due to political reasons. It was a typical political action designed to bring England into a joint policy. The agreement stipulated that the total displacement of the German Navy would be equal to 35% of the British. The document established displacement also by individual classes of ships. As a result, the command of the German Navy was actually removed from the decision-making on the first route issue with regard to England. She was excluded from the number of potential adversaries. The essence of the Anglo-German Naval Agreement was that the German naval forces in peacetime were to carry the functions of a political factor and in wartime to fight a continental enemy. The analysis of the resulting strategic tasks of the naval forces was complicated by the fact that a number of important questions remained without a clear and definite answer. For example, the question remained open as to how politically realistic the German struggle against a continental European power would be without the participation of an Anglo-Saxon naval power. In solving the second cardinal question about the forces and means necessary to solve the strategic tasks in the fight against the continental enemy, the German Navy was bound by a maritime agreement which determined the displacement of individual classes of ships as a percentage of the corresponding English data. It is true that the agreement did not impose obligations regarding the types of ships within the individual classes. As stated above, the decision on what ships should be built in principle is the prerogative of the supreme command. But the latter, before making a final decision, always seeks the opinion of the fleet command. This primarily concerned the construction of submarines and was explained, firstly by the fact that after a 17-year hiatus submarines were largely an uncharted area for the German Navy, and secondly by the fact that the commander-in-chief very much considered the opinion of the commander of the submarine forces and above all in matters of submarine construction. Further events will show to what extent I influenced the decision on submarine construction issues, based on the experience of the First World War, as well as the level of development of combat technology submarine before the Second World War was evaluated in tactical and operational terms as follows. As already indicated, the submarine was a good torpedo carrier, but a poor artillery ship. Its use as an artillery ship was not favourable, in particular, the low location of the gun platform and the insignificant range of observation. The submarine was convenient for laying mines, as it could stealthily penetrate the coastal, the busiest waters of the enemy, and also stealthily leave them without arousing any suspicion. Submarine in the surface position is slow compared to all classes of surface ships, and therefore is of little use for tactical interaction with them. In fact, it is not of interest for reconnaissance due to the limited range of observation. In selecting the most appropriate type of submarine, it was necessary to take into account the indisputable fact that it is the only warship, which only in extremely rare cases have to fight with their own kind. Therefore, in determining the size and magnitude of the combat power of the projected submarine, completely eliminates an extremely important question taken into account in the construction of ships of other classes. What power has the corresponding class of ship in the potential enemy? Consequently, when choosing the type of submarine, can ignore the displacement of submarines of foreign fleets. In the construction of submarines, it was not at all necessary to imitate the rivalry that has developed in our century in respect of surface ships between all the powers, each of which has been relentlessly monitoring the armament of the enemy. If in spite of this in some foreign fleets such imitation in the creation of submarines still took place, it can also be explained by the desire to increase the displacement to increase the combat power of submarines. However, this tendency was wrong. The combat power of a submarine does not increase in direct proportion to its size, as in other warships. On the contrary, if a certain limit is exceeded, some particularly valuable combat qualities of the submarine deteriorate. The dive time required for the boat to go from a surface position to a safe depth increases. The dive itself is performed with great difficulty a tendency to increase the bow trim, which takes dangerous dimensions. In addition, there are difficulties associated with underwater running. The underwater conditions become more complicated, and this makes it more difficult for the officer in charge of diving techniques to control the boat. A large boat is more difficult to control at periscope depth. At a certain differential, 
it is more difficult to keep a longer boat from showing its bow or stern out of the water, and this can happen if the boat goes under the periscope in the open sea in a wave or dead heat. A big boat also has limited manoeuvrability, its circulation radius is larger. Consequently, in both the surface and underwater positions, it takes longer to turn than a smaller boat. Large boat worse manoeuvring, and this is a big disadvantage in night attacks, when the situation is rapidly changing. Finally, a large submarine has a large silhouette and is easier to detect. However, a submarine with an increased displacement can certainly accommodate more weapons, provisions and fuel. It has an increased range and better crew accommodations can be made. It is possible that in some navies these factors may have contributed to the increased size of submarines, but it should not be forgotten that the load the crew can bear is not unlimited even under good accommodation conditions. As a rule, after a two-month combat tour, the personnel need rest. For this reason alone, a significant increase in ranges of limited value. All these considerations created a large scope for choosing the best type of boat. The problem was to find the most appropriate, satisfying all operational requirements. Combination of such contradictory elements as ease of control in surface and underwater position, ease of control and tactical maneuverability on the one hand, and range on a boat of about 500 tons. Displacement proved to be the golden mean for these two contradictory requirements. In favor of such a submarine speaks one very important circumstance. If several positions at sea are occupied by single small boats, they will have a better chance of finding the enemy and succeeding than a single boat of much larger size, capable of occupying only one position. For surface ships, this seemingly hackneyed truth is not always true, but for submarines which have little range of observation, it is true, as displacement increases, there is little or no increase in observation capability. This issue became particularly important because the Anglo-German naval agreement limited the total displacement of submarines being built. The whole question was to distribute the displacement we were allowed to have as expediently as possible. For this reason, it was more advantageous. For example, instead of one submarine of 2,000 tons displacement, to build four submarines of 500 tons displacement each. In the summer of 1935, the following submarines were under construction or had already been built in Germany. Standard displacement about 250 tons, three bow torpedo tubes, surface speed 12-13 knots, range 3,100 miles, a very successful, simple in design, small submarine. Or displacement 712 tons, four bow and two aft torpedo tubes, surface speed 17 knots, range 7,900 miles, less successful design when urgently submerged, the submarine had a dangerous tendency to increase trim and required skillful control. Which is its Enerine's VI series. Displacement of about 500 tons. Four forward and one aft torpedo tubes. Surface speed 16 knots. Range 6,200 miles. This type of submarine proved itself to be excellent. In 1936, my view of submarine construction was as follows. The IA series submarines built for the Vetigen flotilla were further excluded from the shipbuilding programs. This type did not satisfy neither its combat power, nor range, nor speed, because of unsatisfactory tactical and technical characteristics, and I-Series was not suitable for further construction. Thus, there was a boat VI series. It was a further development of the submarine BIT series of the First World War. Comprehensive tests and practical checks carried out at the Salzweedel submarine Flotilla soon showed that it was a reliable and manageable submarine. She had the maximum combat power for her class. With a displacement at about 500 tons on the boat had four forward and one aft torpedo apparatus. The submarine had 12-14 torpedoes. Its dive time was equal to 20 seconds. In the surface position the boat was relatively fast and in the underwater position had very good maneuvering qualities. The disadvantage of the submarine was the short range which was caused by a very limited supply of fuel and lubricants. This submarine seemed to me the best synthesis of all the contradictory requirements. It could have been considered ideal if, with a small increase in tonnage, it had been possible to substantially increase the fuel reserve and, consequently, the cruising range. By rational use of space, while increasing the standard displacement of the boat by 17 tonnes, we managed to increase the fuel reserve to 108 tonnes. 
This brought the submarine's range to 8,700 miles. Series Viabe was redesigned in January 1939 as Series Viac. The boats of this series, along with a slight increase in size, had improvements in the bow and deckhouse. Meanwhile, in the period 1936-1937 years, group tactics took more and more distinct forms. The essence of it was reduced to the following. The boats occupied in the surface position of the given initial positions, the boat, the first to detect the enemy, maintained continuous contact with him and directed at him as many submarines as possible for a joint attack. This method was used mainly at night, in a surface position. For such, tactical interaction was particularly suitable for the swivel and fast submarine VI series. Therefore, in the spring of 1937, I asked the Navy leadership to make a small increase in the size of the VI series submarine proposed by the flagship mechanical engineer to increase the fuel reserve and in the future to build mainly boats of this type, allocating them about three quarters of the total displacement, which gave us the Anglo-German Maritime Agreement. I further proposed to build submarines of 740 tons displacement, which had a longer range and were intended for action in remote sea areas. It soon became clear that the Naval Command held a different opinion. It believed that in future warfare, submarines would continue to operate alone. Influential people rejected the group tactics I developed, arguing that the group action will break radio silence and the enemy will be able to identify the submarines and identify their location. I, however, believed that radio silence was not an end in itself, and that it could be broken if necessary to conduct an operation with a large number of submarines in order to achieve a major success. Despite my objections, the Naval Command believed that in creating a submarine fleet, the main attention should be paid to the construction of ocean-going submarines displacement of about 2,000 tons, having a long range, a large stock of torpedoes and, most importantly, capable of artillery combat in the surface position. In terms of speed of construction they were to rank first, the difference in views on the nature of submarine operations in the future war, and hence the expediency of building submarines of certain subclasses led to the fact that after 1935, the problem of submarine construction seemed to the Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces not clear enough, and the registration of orders for the construction of submarines was postponed. This was reflected in the number of submarines built and put into service. 1935, 14 submarines. 1936, 21 submarines. 1937, 1 submarine. 1939, 18 submarines. From the end of 1937, and during the years 1938-1939, the difference of opinion between the chief command of the naval forces and the commander of the submarine forces on the issues of submarine construction became more and more acute. I was more and more inclined to think that Hitler's policy and the continuous strengthening of Germany's power would inevitably arouse the hostility of England. Historical facts showed that since September 2, 1870, England had constantly opposed the growth of German power and there was no reason to believe that she had suddenly decided to reconcile herself to the existence of a great Germany. I believe that war with England might arise in the not-too-distant future, and therefore made increasingly persistent proposals for accelerating the construction of German submarine forces. These views were put on the basis of combat training of submarines. Gradually, the exercises, aimed at practicing the tactics of group actions of boats against convoys, began to be transferred to more remote sea areas, and when the opportunity presented itself, even in the Atlantic. At the end of 1937, I even asked permission to conduct exercises in the Atlantic Ocean with the participation of the mother ship Sayer. Submarines of 500 tons displacement and two large submarines I series, U-25 and U-2000. However, this request was denied. Exercises conducted in 1937 soon showed that applying group tactics in large areas of the open sea the command of the submarine forces cannot do without a headquarters ship equipped with special means of communication. The request for such a ship was also denied by the Naval Forces Command, because it still believed that in future warfare the submarines would operate alone. It took the personal intervention of the Commander-in-Chief of the Naval Forces, and only then was my request granted. In 1938, the political situation sharply escalated, and I appealed to the Naval Command with a proposal to deploy in advance in foreign waters flotilla of submarines, so that in the event of war to instantly take positions on important enemy communications. To this end, it was proposed that 
1. To introduce a three-year course of training in the submarine force, so that during the first year there would be single training, during the second year maneuvers, and during the third a foreign voyage. 2. Allocate two floating workshops to provide for submarine flotillas and their floating bases during the overseas campaign. During the winter of 1938-39, exercises were conducted on the boundless expanses of the Atlantic, during which the problems of group tactics were investigated, in particular, the problems of force control, occupation of initial positions, search, guidance and attack of the convoy by submarines, both sides were not bound by any conditions. The convoy commanders had the entire Atlantic Ocean area at their disposal and were free to determine the convoy routes. The exercise led to the following conclusion. 1. If the enemy, which I did not doubt, will pull together their ships in convoys and organize their protection, Germany will need at least 300 submarines to successfully fight against the enemy's merchant shipping. At the same time, 100 submarines will be in bases, on repair, and their crews. On vacation, 100. On transitions from bases to areas of combat operations and from areas of combat operations to bases and 100 directly in areas of combat operations on enemy communications, there was confidence that with such a number of submarines, it was possible to achieve decisive successes in combat operations against enemy merchant shipping. 2. The commander of the submarine forces believed that, being ashore at the command post, he would not be able to properly manage the forces in the area of combat operations and organize their interaction, and I had no doubt that at such a great distance, the commander of the submarine forces would have a very poor understanding of the situation. First of all of the state of anti-submarine defences and weather, everything said that the operational and tactical deployment of submarines to search for convoys should be carried out under the general guidance of the commander of the submarine forces, that is, from the shore. In the very area of convoy movement, the submarine control should be transferred to the junior commander, who is located at some distance from the convoy, on the submarine remaining, if possible, in a surface position. This made it necessary to equip some of the submarines under construction, with particularly powerful communications equipment for use as headquarters submarines. 3. With the number of submarines that were in service during the period described, and with the expected increase in the coming years in the fight against merchant shipping, was possible to inflict only pinpricks on the enemy. The results of these exercises were reported to the fleet commander, Admiral Boehm, and to the commander-in-chief of the Navy. The fleet commander supported the above arguments and favoured granting my demands. The plan of the exercise was based on the assumption that the enemy, despite the agreement on submarines, concluded in 1936, will introduce a system of convoys. This view was not universally shared. If the terms of the agreement were precisely fulfilled, there was no need to introduce the convoy system at all, since the submarines would act in strict adherence to the principles of prize law even when encountering vessels that had guns mounted only in self-defense. However, with all due diligence, it was inconceivable that enemy merchant ships would behave in accordance with the terms of the agreement, allow themselves to be sunk by a ship as easily vulnerable as a submarine, without giving advance notice of its discovery, and without defending themselves, especially if they had guns mounted for self-defense only. In addition, the clause authorizing the installation of guns for self-defense only was not at all clear from a military point of view. When does the defense begin? When the submarine intends to sink the vessel in accordance with the prize right, or when it is detected by the vessel? It is now interesting to consider how the question of compliance with the 1936 agreement and the possible application of the convoy system was assessed in England in those years. In 1937, negotiations took place between the English Admiralty and the British Air Force command on measures to protect English merchant shipping in the event of war. The Admiralty believed that the most effective measure to combat the submarine and air enemy would be the timely introduction of a system of convoys. Headquarters Air Force expressed fears that the reduction of ships in convoys will increase the chances of success of enemy aircraft and entail heavy losses in transports. The British Admiralty had no doubt that the guarding ships could effectively protect the ships from submarine attacks and air raids, because they are armed with ASDIC and anti-aircraft weapons. The British Air Force Command did not believe in either ASDIC or anti-aircraft artillery. Nevertheless, they reached an agreement that was approved by the British Imperial Defence Committee on December 2, 1937. 
The agreement suggested that during the war the enemy was likely to make extensive use of submarines and aircraft against British merchant shipping. In this regard, it was noted that it was necessary to introduce a convoy system. In the Guidelines for the Protection of Merchant Shipping issued in 1938, the British Admiralty instructed merchant ships to radio their coordinates when submarines were detected, and thus included merchant shipping in the British Naval Warning Network. This regulation contradicts the letter and spirit of the Submarine Force Agreement of 1936, which prohibited merchant ships from taking any part in hostilities. It proves that already in peacetime England was not going to honour the agreement. In accordance with the Merchant Navy Defence Manual, 1938 edition, English merchant ships were armed shortly after the outbreak of war. The installation of guns on ships was not solely for self-defence. This is borne out by the behaviour of armed merchant ships towards detected submarines immediately after the outbreak of war. In a number of cases, merchant ships fired on submarines without any delay. We shall return to this when we describe the first months of the war. So, as early as 1938, England issued instructions that were contrary to the agreement on submarine forces. In 1937, the British decided to introduce a convoy system in the event of war, not counting on compliance with the 1936 Agreement on Submarine Forces. Churchill, appointed in 1939, that is, immediately after the outbreak of war, the British naval minister, in his memoirs, writes, On the evening of September 4, I held my first conference at the Admiralty. Here are its decisions in my narrative. 1. In the first stage, as long as Japan has not entered the war, and Italy is neutral, Though hesitant, the first attack will obviously be directed against England's communications in the Atlantic. 2. A convoy system must be introduced. By convoy system is meant only anti-submarine defence. All matters relating to raiders and heavy ships are not mentioned in these special instructions. Thus, since 1937, the command of the German submarine forces correctly assessed the situation. It practised in exercises against convoys, and demanded an increase in the number of submarines. The previous section assessed the politico-military situation and the resulting strategic objectives of the submarine force. It contains conclusions regarding combat training and further construction of submarine forces. The plans of the Naval High Command became known to me only in the summer of 1939, when they had already been formulated. At the end of May 1938, Hitler informed the Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces that England is a potential adversary of Germany, but the conflict with her is not in the near future. Following this information, in the fall of 1938, the Naval Commander-in-Chief formed a planning committee to consider the new tasks thus presented to the Navy and to determine what means of warfare at sea were necessary to meet them. As a result of a number of studies, the planning committee concluded that the strategic task of the German Navy is to destroy British merchant shipping. To accomplish this task, the naval commander proposed to Hitler to begin construction of a powerful, well-balanced fleet, which was to operate in battle groups on British communications in the open areas of the Atlantic Ocean against merchant ships and their guard forces. A long-term programme for the construction of this fleet was drawn up, formalised in the so-called Plan Z. This plan called for the construction of the following warships by 1948. One six-line ships of 50,000 tons, displacement each. Two eight battleships of 20,000 tons, displacement. Three four aircraft carriers of 20,000 tons, displacement. Four a considerable number of light cruises. Five 233 submarines. In January 1939, Hitler approved the plan and demanded that it be accomplished within six years. The Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces issued an order that in implementing the plan, preference was to be given to line ships and submarines. Construction of the ocean-going submarines envisioned in the plan was to be completed in 1943. In general, Plan Z emphasised the construction of the surface fleet. This handling of the matter was not in accord with my views of the situation and the proposals in which I stated my views. In my view, Plan Z suffered from the following deficiencies. 1. It required at least six years for its implementation. During this period, the German Navy would not have been able to prepare to fight England, even though the political situation was tense. 2. If we began to build line ships, cruisers and aircraft carriers at an accelerated pace, 
the enemy would no doubt respond in kind. Out of this arms race, the enemy would emerge victorious, especially since the displacement of our big ships that would have entered service was far short of the 35% of British tonnage we were allowed to have. 3. German bases and shipyards were located dangerously close to England. Therefore, the fleet battle groups located in them could easily be subjected to air attacks. For submarines, we could build shelters, but for large surface ships, no. At the same time, the English fleet could take refuge from German aviation in remote bases in northern England. 4. The plan did not take into account the peculiarities of Germany's geographical position. Vital arteries of England are west of the British Isles in the vastness of the Atlantic, and in order that the German naval forces could act effectively, they had to make the transition to these areas and stay there for a long time. That is why, when planning the construction of ships, it was extremely important to take into account to what extent they meet this requirement. The geographical position of Germany is extremely unfavourable for the German naval forces to enter the Atlantic area. In relation to the British sea lanes, we, figuratively speaking, live on the backside. In front of Germany stretches Great Britain, whose natural geographical position allows her to block the waters of the North Sea. The enemy can easily detect and attack the German naval forces while they are crossing the North Sea, heading for the passage between the Shetland Islands and Norway. Since the German warships have to follow the coast of the British Isles from south to north, once they are detected, they can be repeatedly attacked by light naval forces and aircraft of England. Due to the development of aviation, the conditions for breaking through to the operational space have become even more unfavourable for us than in the First World War. Hide from the enemy exit ships from the bases can be only at the confluence of particularly favourable circumstances. Finding the German surface forces in the open sea and their conduct of hostilities is also complicated by the fact that a result of damage and reduction of combat power, they may be in much greater danger than the enemy. Damaged ships going to Germany for repair will have to travel a long way, exposed to enemy attacks. The British Navy, on the other hand, had bases for ship repairs on the west coast of Great Britain, that is, close to the battle area. This unfavourable, compared to England's strategic position of Germany, made itself known in the First World War. In 1914, we envisioned the solution of all our strategic tasks at sea in one decisive battle and expected that victory would have extremely important consequences in the military and political fields and would undermine British naval power. However, the strategic situation did not compel England to seek such a naval battle as long as the German fleet did not disrupt British communications in the Atlantic and did not counter the blockade of Germany in the North Sea. And to these tasks, the German Navy did not have a sufficient operational area. Further, because of excessive caution, we did not impose England battles in the period when the balance of forces still allowed us to hope for a favourable outcome of the operation. When the balance of forces changed, hopes for a favourable outcome of the battle disappeared. It became clear that the German fleet, locked in the southern part of the North Sea, will not be able to further solve important strategic problems. The latter went to the German submarine fleet, which could attack in the Atlantic British marine communications. The actions of the German open sea fleet, as it was formulated after the Battle of Jutland, Admiral Scheer, were limited to the fact that he kept open the approaches to the German submarine bases that performed this task. The negative aspects of our geographical position and much less affected the actions of submarines. They stealthily overcame the North Sea and went to the vital for England in the Atlantic, and the enemy's surface forces were unable to impose them to fight because of this, as well as by virtue of the longer range and autonomy, compared to surface forces, they could stay in the designated strategic area for a long time, despite the fact that the enemy's surface forces dominated there. These factors, not to mention the offensive qualities inherent in submarines, made the boats the most promising forces in terms of striking British communications and achieving the strategic goals of Germany at sea. Thus, in World War I, the submarine almost led England to defeat. Having studied the lessons of combat operations at sea during the First World War, I eventually came to the idea that one day England will one way or another be our enemy, and that to fight it the most appropriate means of warfare at sea will be submarine forces. Having developed the tactics of group action, the effectiveness of which proved the exercises conducted, I expected to cope with the system of convoys, which in the First World War saved England from defeat. These are the reasons that made it necessary 
in opposition to Plan Z, to demand, beginning in the spring of 1939, the most accelerated construction of a large submarine fleet, the submarine construction envisaged in Plan Z, the completion of which was postponed until 1948, showed that the High Command had rejected the proposals concerning the construction of the submarine fleet, both as regards types and numbers of submarines and as regards the pace of construction. And I was not alone in saying that the construction of a large number of submarines should be accelerated from the spring of 1939. This was followed by the entry into Czechoslovakia and then England's declaration of guarantees to Poland. On April 26, 1939, Hitler denounced the Anglo-German Naval Agreement of 1935, an extremely strong political gen. The denunciation clearly indicated that the policy aimed at reaching an agreement with England had come to an end, and that both now and in the future Germany did not expect to improve relations with England. Suddenly it became clear that it was impossible to hope for a lasting peace, which was a prerequisite for the fulfilment of the long-range Plan Z. As a result of the sharp aggravation of relations between Germany and England, which found expression in the denunciation of the Maritime Agreement, no political leadership could vouch for the fact that this tension at any time will not be diffused by military conflict. Therefore, the main task facing the German Navy was to accelerate the construction of submarines. This view was shared by other naval authorities, which, in addition to accelerating the construction of the submarine fleet, proposed to build light surface raiders. It was believed that they would be suitable for direct attack on enemy communications in open areas of the Atlantic, and the risk of losing these light, easy to build ships, was small. In my opinion, this concept was quite realistic, although a breakthrough from the North Sea to the Atlantic remained highly problematic. Of course, in addition to the offensive forces intended for the Atlantic, it was necessary to build ships to ensure the free exit of these forces from German territorial waters. In June 1939, I reported to the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy about my assumption, which was shared by my officers, that there was a danger of a close war with England. And although I was only a captain of the first rank and held a relatively small position, I asked him to tell Hitler my point of view. In the impending war, the main burden of combat operations at sea will lie on the submarine forces, and the latter, because of their small numbers, can only inflict the enemy pinpricks. July 22, 1939, the Commander-in-Chief, on behalf of Hitler, informed the officers of the submarine forces gathered on the messenger ship that there would be no war with England, as it would be tantamount to Finnish Germania. This statement, however, did not dispel all our fears. On the same day, I said to my officers, if it ever comes to war, England will stand on the side of our adversaries. You must always be prepared for that. The same day I asked the Commander-in-Chief for a leave of absence. My request was granted, but already on August 15, I was recalled from leave, because in view of the extreme aggravation of the political situation, it was necessary for precautionary reasons to occupy the concentration areas provided for in the mobilization plan. In these days, when the danger of war with England became obvious to everyone, I decided that it makes sense to once again put in writing to the Commander-in-Chief my point of view on the situation and the need to urgently deploy a wide construction of submarines. At the end of August 1939, during a joint flight to Swinmundi, I asked the Commander-in-Chief to read the outline of my report. The Commander-in-Chief was in agreement and suggested that a report note on the types and number of submarines needed be submitted as soon as possible. This report note, under the heading Thoughts on the Construction of the Submarine Fleet, was sent on August 28, 1939, to the Commander-in-Chief of the Naval Forces and the Commander of the Surface Fleet. It state, In view of the fact that at present German relations with England are extremely strained and there is a danger of war between these countries, I state the fact that the Navy, especially the submarine forces, at the moment is not in a position to fulfill the tasks which will confront it with the outbreak of war. Let us hope that this time war will not arise. However, there is every reason to believe that political relations between England and Germany will not undergo a radical change toward improvement in the coming years. Even if there are future periods of mutual rapprochement and appeasement, the most effective means of warfare which does not require long periods of construction is the submarine. Therefore, the Navy should immediately deploy the construction of submarine forces and thus improve its position in the coming conflicts with England. Regarding the number and types of submarines required, 
The report stated the following. Evaluating the results of the exercises conducted in 1938-1939 under my supervision, I stated my views as follow. The basic type suitable for action in the Atlantic is a torpedo-armed submarine. Our existing VI and X series submarines are suitable for this purpose. Successful operations would require 100 submarines permanently on alert. In all, at least 300 submarines will be required. There is no upper limit to the number of submarines required. The ratio of VRB and VX series submarines to X series submarines should be 3. Having outlined the requirements for submarines of special types, I summarize. I believe that for the successful conduct of the war against England, the presence of all these submarines is necessary. It further states, With the number of submarines presently in service and planned for construction, it cannot be expected that we will be able to exert effective pressure on England by decisive military action against the English merchant fleet. On the contrary, we will be able to inflict on English merchant shipping only pinpricks. Se conclusion. It is necessary by all possible means, including those beyond the usual limits, to bring the number of submarines to such a level that will allow them during the war to solve their main task during the war. The task of crushing England. In doing so, the following course should be followed. A. The General Directorate of Naval Forces should determine, and the Commander-in-Chief should decide which tasks can be postponed in the interests of submarine construction, which shipyards will be freed for submarine construction, and which will be able to expand their equipment, which factories can be attracted additionally in the construction of submarines. To draw up a maximum program for the construction of submarines, especially referring to the boats of VWB and X series. Simultaneously with the development of these issues, and independently of the finalization of the construction program, the following tasks arising from the accelerated implementation of the program should be start. Construction of patrol ships, minesweepers, floating repair bases, shorts and bases, provision of ammunition, fuel and repair shops, provision of communication facilities, training of personnel, organizational issues. These questions can be solved only if the other requirements are fully subordinated to this great purpose. However, carrying out decisive measures is possible only under one organizational condition, namely if all issues related to the construction of submarine forces will be addressed by a single centre with broad authority and subordinate directly to the Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces. Fleet Commander Admiral Bohm strongly supported the considerations contained in my report. His report, submitted to the Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces on September 3, 1939 d, he ended with the following words. It is necessary to concentrate all forces on the fulfilment of the decisive task and not hesitate to postpone the implementation of other construction plans that do not serve the above-named purpose. This is how I viewed the situation and the tasks of naval construction in the critical months of 1939. Undoubtedly, it was easier for me to develop a certain point of view than the commander-in-chief of the Navy who was in Berlin. The latter was constantly under the influence of Hitler, whose political guidelines were binding on him. In 1939, there was also discussed the question of what action would follow from England if after the denunciation of the Anglo-German Maritime Agreement, Germany will deploy, in accordance with my proposals, the construction of submarines. It was feared that, since such construction could not be kept secret, the British would begin to increase the number of their anti-submarine ships. And this argument, in all probability, was correct. However, the construction of submarines can be largely dispersed and camouflaged, which would be more appropriate than the ongoing in full view of the construction of large ships under Plan Z. But the most important thing was that, even creating a large anti-submarine forces, it is impossible to achieve the cessation of submarine warfare, as later combat practice has shown. The British Admiralty, as already noted, in peacetime was limited to the problem of combating submarines attacking in an underwater position, overestimated the capabilities of ASDIC, and underestimated the underwater danger in general. It was therefore difficult to decide how effective forms England's response to Germany's construction of submarines would have taken. But one way or another, the assumption that then the English would build anti-submarine ships was not a reason for not building submarines. The British would not have been indifferent to the construction of the large ships envisaged in the Z-Plan, an arms race on an even larger scale, for many reasons very disadvantageous for us, would surely have begun. 
there is a great deal of speculation today as to how relations with England would have changed if, after the termination of the naval agreement, Germany had begun extensive construction of submarine forces. Some believe that if Hitler had tried to resolve the Polish corridor issue by political rather than military means, England would have had more reason to go to war with Germany than it would have with the slow construction of a balanced navy. Others argued that, on the contrary, by starting the construction of a large submarine fleet, we would gain a major trump card, which would be very useful to us, for example in negotiations with England. Apparently, both assumptions had no solid ground. After the denunciation of the Maritime Agreement, we were obliged to prepare for war against England as soon as possible, whether it would arise or not. This could only be accomplished by forcing the construction of the submarine fleet. The assertions that German shipyards and German industry were unable to realize the extensive construction of submarine forces before 1943 are unfounded. Even during the war up to 1943, the capacity of the German steel industry was such that for the production of weapons of the navy was enough to produce less than 5% of the steel produced in Germany, and for the construction of submarines are suitable not only sea, but also river shipyards. Thus, the capacity of the steel industry and shipyards was sufficient. Now let us turn to the events of late August 1939. On August 28, in a report note, I expressed the hope that after the cancellation of the attack on Poland, which was scheduled for August 25, war would not yet arise. However, my hopes were not realized. On September 1, action against Poland began. On September 3, England and France declared war on Germany. The German Navy looked extremely helpless. Submarine forces had only 46 submarines which were in a state of readiness. In total, there were 56 submarines in service. But of these 46 boats, only 22 submarines were suitable for action in the Atlantic. The rest of the boats, because of the short range, were suitable for action only in the North Sea area. Thus, uh, four to seven submarines could simultaneously operate in the Atlantic. However, it had to be taken into account that even this small number of submarines would be reduced. The expected losses were not expected to be compensated by new submarines. We were punished for our inactivity in 1936-1937. We had to start the war with only 56 submarines in service. If we had used the right obtained in 1935 to build submarines whose total displacement was 45% of the British, there would have been 16 more submarines suitable for action in the Atlantic. Among other things, we were depressed by the thought that the number of submarines would dwindle and quickly reach its minimum, and events did not take long to unfold. In February 1941, we had only 22 submarines left in service. Apparently, it is rare for an entire branch of arms to enter a war with so few combat assets. They could be used to inflict only pinpricks on the enemy. Submarines were clearly insufficient for the Empire, one of the strongest maritime powers, to request peace. Therefore, in 1939, it was necessary to avoid war at all costs, if only because of the extremely low level of our naval armament. Could Germany, which was increasing its power, avoid war with England for a long time? No one could say that with certainty. I don't think so. If before 1914 the other side did not even recognize Bismarck's little German nation-state, it was unlikely to tolerate a great German Reich. If conflict with England was inevitable, strong conclusions should have been drawn regarding German armaments at sea. German state leaders did not recognize the true state of affairs. It is true that the commander-in-chief of the naval forces gave warnings, but he himself was forced to adhere to the instructions of the state leadership. There was one of the most tragic situations in the history of the German Navy. When war broke out, the commander-in-chief of the Navy immediately ordered to stop the construction of all large ships not yet launched, to cancel the construction of submarines provided for in Plan Z, and to accelerate the transfer of orders for the construction of submarines in such numbers and of such types as I had demanded in my report after the end of the 1938-1939 exercises and in my report of August 28, 1939. It was now obvious to everyone that our most important task was the construction of a large submarine force, and it had to be carried out as soon as possible and with maximum energy, using even extraordinary measures and transferring to it the center of gravity of all shipbuilding. I decided to leave the submarine force, which I prepared and trained since 1935. It was now, when they were raring to go into battle, that I appealed to the commander-in-chief to entrust me 
with the task of directing the construction of a large submarine force, the most important task facing the Navy. On September 9, 1939, I made the following entry in the Journal of Combat Operation. The decision has been made. It would be correct for me to take over the task of building a submarine force as Chief of Department or in some other capacity. It was wrong in principle to take away from the submarine fleet combat officer, who from the very beginning led its training, knows the strength of officers and crews and whom they know well, and to take away at the very moment when the results of combat training are tested in practice. But at the same time, the combat capabilities of the submarines still available may run out in the near future if it is not possible to quickly build a large and effective submarine fleet. Therefore, the construction of submarines had to be regarded as the most important task of the Submarine Force Command. I requested that I be given the appropriate assignment. However, in the evening of September 5, Chief of Staff of the Leadership of the War at Sea, Rear Admiral Schneewind informed me that the Commander-in-Chief of the Navy rejected my request. In his opinion, the Commander of the Submarine Forces is necessary in the fleet. It was necessary to create a Submarine Forces Directorate, which the Commander-in-Chief actually expected to subordinate to the Commander of the Submarine Forces. The latter was to make his demands directly to the Directorate, and the Directorate was obliged to fulfil them unconditionally. I had to declare that such leadership from the bottom up was impossible, and that it was possible to exercise vigorous and unified leadership only from the centre, that is, from Berlin. The course of submarine construction during the war proved the correctness of this point of view. Being in the fleet, it was impossible to exert a proper influence on the high command in Berlin with regard to the construction of the submarine fleet. Despite the paramount importance of the construction of submarines, the decision of the commander-in-chief, rejecting my request, as the war showed, was absolutely correct. Personal guidance from a senior superior. In this case, the commander of submarine forces, during war is one of the most important aspects of military service. The higher the demands, the greater the need for mutual trust. The higher the moral cohesion and the greater the dedication of the troops, the greater their combat power. In war, martial art alone is not enough. Self-sacrifice is required of the soldier. This requirement needs some kind of counterbalance, which, of course, can only be of a moral order. So the commander-in-chief made a decision that put me in charge of submarine warfare. The construction of submarines remained the prerogative of the High Command in Berlin. Even the Nuremberg Tribunal and its verdict cleared me of charges of planning a war of aggression. I was not prosecuted for starting the war even at Nuremberg. However, my conviction was justified by the fact that submarines, which were then few in number, were fully prepared to wage war. In all times and in all nations hitherto it has not been the custom to penalise a soldier for having prepared his army for war in time of peace. For that is his first and self-evident duty to government and nation. So the German submarine forces were prepared for war, as far as it is at all possible to prepare them in peacetime. Now they were to be tested in battle.